Now, yesterday we have had a very interesting day with, uh, uh, which I think has prepared the stage for our discussions today about ideas. And just looking at the program this morning, I thought, isn't it interesting that when it comes to the Gulf, we start off with discussing with money <laughs> and then move on to people and then finally to ideas. I wonder whether <laughs> there is a lesson somewhere there. Uh, however, it was quite obvious yesterday that we need to come to terms with the ideas, to look at those both in terms of what ideas are coming from outside as well as what space is there for ideas within the region to flourish and are there some tensions inbuilt in this process. So we have a very interesting panel ahead of us and to kick off I invite Professor Ali Banu Azizi. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my uh, presentation has to do with uh, an assessment of, um, of Iran's role uh, in the Persian Gulf. Um, and I think we could approach this from uh, perhaps uh, three or four um, different uh, perspectives. Um, I would rather uh, refer to them as um, frames, um, that is, to look at this relationship from uh, or within uh, two or three different, uh, three or four different frames. And um, uh, obviously, these are very much interconnected. Uh, but at least for um, analytical purposes, um, it might be useful to look at each of these frames and the operative um, uh, factors um, and circumstances within each, um, and then to try to um, bring them um, together. Uh, perhaps a good place um, to start um, th this discussion um, is uh, to ask the question of whether uh, one can uh, detect or define um, a consistent uh, policy uh, for Iran vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, its neighbors um, in the Gulf um, region. Um, and if so, um, what are the objectives um, that um, Iran has pursued um, looking at the past um, 30 years uh, uh, since uh, 1979, um, the Islamic um, Revolution? Um, and uh, is it the case, um, as is often um, uh, uh, said, um, that Iran seeks to play um, a hegemonic role um, in, in the Persian Gulf, and what uh, does that uh, exactly uh, imply? Um, I think um, a, an even cursory uh, review of the history of this um, relationship um, over this period of the past uh, three decades um, would um, indicate um, relatively a little consistency um, in Iran's attitudes um, and behavior um, towards um, the region. Um, as uh, most of you know, in the immediate um, aftermath um, of the revolution, uh, much like other um, world revolutions, uh, um, Iran's principal um, uh, ideological position was uh, to spread the Islamic revolution um, and to uh, challenge uh, and adopt a very hostile attitudes um, towards um, the, uh, uh, the traditional monarchies uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Persian Gulf. And um, I recall uh, Khomeini making the statement, for example, about the Saudi king that he's worse than uh, Saddam Hussein. Um, and that attitude uh, uh, continued. Um, uh, for much of the 1980s and, of course, was overwhelmed uh, by the Iran-Iraq um, war um, where uh, the uh, Gulf countries um, uh, sided, uh, of course, uh, uh, with, uh, with the Iraqis um, in, in that um, conflict. Uh, however, uh, 
with the death of Khomeini and the ending of the war, a period of um, relative moderation uh, began to take shape in Iran's um, uh, foreign policy and attitudes um, towards um, the Gulf states. Um, this is under um, Rafsanjani. Um, and uh, there were several openings, um, visits, and exchanges, uh, relatively good relations even with, uh, uh, or especially I should say, with, um, with Saudi Arabia during um, that period. Um, that trend um, continued um, under uh, <coughs> President Khatami, in fact, was expanded, uh, and relations became even uh, better and less tension um, ridden uh, in, in that, uh, during that uh, period. Um, with the election of uh, Ahmadinejad in 2005, um, a new phase uh, began, and now the picture became much more complex and mixed, and I will come to uh, some details of that um, in, uh, in, uh, in a short time. So let me now move to my first frame uh, in looking at, uh, at this um, relationship, having just given you a very brief uh, history of it. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, this frame uh, would look at the uh, issues, at the relationships, at tensions, at the affinities uh, between Iran and its neighbors um, in the region. Um, by focusing on what would be endogenous uh, factors. That is, what exactly uh, is the content uh, of this relationship and what are the tensions uh, within this relationship? What are the rivalries? Uh, what are the attitudes? And what are uh, the concrete economic dimensions um, of this relationship? Um, I think this is very important for any kind of analysis uh, of, uh, of the general theme that uh, we're talking about, to have a much more fine-grained approach and to explore um, these uh, uh, bilateral and sometimes multilateral um, relationships. Needless to say, uh, there have been um, historic tensions between Iran um, and uh, several of the Gulf states. <coughs> Um, with uh, Bahrain uh, from time to time. Um, there have been uh, statements, if one goes back to the 1960s and 1970s, of course, there were uh, serious claims that Bahrain um, is a province um, of, of Iran and Iran made uh, such uh, claims. But those tended to subside. Um, however, from time to time, again, uh, even those kinds of statements are repeated as recently as um, a few months ago uh, by some prominent uh, members of uh, Iranian um, political elite, um, for example, within um, the parliament. Um, another manifestation of this very tension um, has to do with the naming uh, um, of the Gulf uh, and the insistence uh, uh, on the part of Iran um, that it is the Persian Gulf, not the Gulf, not certainly not the uh, Arabian Gulf and the Persian Gulf. Um, there is no question that there is historical validity uh, to that claim. Uh, that is, if one were to go back to, you know, from the time of the Greeks to the present uh, period, uh, there is no uh, evidence that it was ever called anything other uh, than the Persian Gulf. Uh, within uh, the international community in the more recent years, and it has been uh, recognized as such. Uh, but it's uh, the, uh, the sort of the, the force of, of Iran's uh, uh, position on, on this issue uh, that, for example, led uh, just a few weeks ago uh, to the cancellation uh, of the uh, Islamic uh, uh, unity games. Uh, th these are games that are arranged among uh, the 57 or so members of the OIC, the Islamic, uh, uh, the Organization of the Islamic Conference, uh, and paradoxically, uh, they were to represent the unity uh, <laughs> of the Muslim nations. Uh, but whereas uh, uh, you know Iran. Uh, 
uh, minted the medals with the Persian Gulf, you know, minted on each of them. Uh, the, uh, there were several uh, representations by uh, various uh, Arab states, principally, I believe, Saudi Arabia, uh, but others as well, uh, <coughs> to, uh, to, uh, to withdraw that. Uh, and when Iran did not uh, comply, uh, then the entire games uh, uh, were canceled. Um, so that's just one eruption, one indication uh, of, uh, of this particular uh, level of, of tension. Um, there is um, the Shi'i-Sunni dimension of, uh, of the tension, uh, with which uh, you're all um, quite uh, familiar, and the Shi'i minorities uh, in uh, Bahrain, a majority, in Kuwait, a minority, uh, now in Yemen, and that has been a bone of contention and uh, uh, has generated its own uh, uh, tensions. But in this respect, uh, let me um, let me state and emphasize that um, Iran is very reluctant, has always been very reluctant to present itself and to take uh, an advocacy position as the Shi'i Muslim country uh, within the greater um, Islamic world. Um, from the very beginning, um, Iran's uh, claims for leadership, uh, for uh, revolutionary transformation, for change in the Muslim world, uh, were couched in universalistic terms. Uh, that is, Iran would not want to limit itself and its claims to uh, the uh, position of advocacy for the Shi'is uh, uh, of the world alone, but for the entire uh, Islamic world. So uh, there are very, very few instances in which the Iranian uh, government has taken uh, you know, an ardently and explicitly pro-Shi'i position, even though there are from time to time you know, complaints uh, and uh, protests about the treatment of, of Shi'is uh, um, in the world. Uh, on the economic front, I think uh, Dr. Habibi mentioned uh, some of these. There are uh, some real examples of cooperation between Iran and several of the Gulf states, uh, even joint projects, uh, gas, for example, uh, and, uh, <coughs> uh, and in various other um, realms. And as was pointed out uh, by uh, one or two of our panelists, of course, the expatriate Iranian population uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, several of the Gulf states um, is quite uh, uh, significant. So these are the kinds of issues that um, the first frame would pick up and must pick up if we are to understand the, the nature of the relationship um, and its vicissitudes uh, over the past um, 30 years. Now, the second frame um, would focus, from my point of view, on factors and circumstances and forces uh, that are exogenous uh, to the region. Uh, they have been brought into the region uh, from the outside and have certainly had an impact uh, on the nature of the relationship between Iran and, uh, and its uh, neighbors. And here, of course, we are principally talking about the entry of the United States um, into the region. And uh, this is, uh, um, sometimes it's forgotten that this is a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, it was not until the declaration the, by the British in 1968 that they were going to withdraw um, their forces east of Suez uh, that the U.S. began to take an active uh, interest strategically uh, in the region. And of course, <coughs> by 1971, which was the date of withdrawal, um, now the uh, the GCC was formed, and various other uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, uh, arrangements were made um, in, in the Gulf. Um, and when we come uh, to the more recent uh, period, of course, then we have uh, the United States' uh, massive uh, entry, uh, 
uh, invasion um, of uh, Afghanistan, then, uh, I then um, Iraq, um, and the Fifth Fleet. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, overnight, um, Iran uh, and the United States became neighbors with the U.S. breathing literally on three sides of, um, of Iran's uh, borders. So um, needless to say, uh, this um, was um, a major um, strategic concern, or it became a major strategic concern, particularly when uh, the axis of evil talk and uh, then uh, talk about the regime change and so on uh, began to, uh, uh, to find currency um, in, um, in the U.S. Um, it's important to point out that at least in its initial phases, uh, this intervention uh, was not in any way directed against Iran. Uh, and indeed, Iran cooperated uh, by all accounts in the case of Afghanistan uh, and mm, had a generally uh, neutral or even supportive attitude <coughs> with respect to, um, to Iraq um, right through the formation of the uh, Shi-dominated government uh, in Iraq. But these are all exogenous um, factors which now began to affect, to influence the relationship between Iran and the various uh, Gulf states in a different um, um, form. Uh, the third um, frame, uh, again entirely exogenous, but with very significant impact on this relationship, uh, has to do with Iran's um, pursuit of uh, nuclear, um, uh, nuclear capability, uh, suspected to be uh, ultimately uh, a quest for uh, uh, nuclear bombs and their delivery system. Uh, this has, in my judgment, nothing to do with Iran's quest for hegemony in the, in the Gulf region. Uh, this does not in any sense portend the conflict between Iran and its Gulf neighbors. Uh, and I believe it's not even perceived in that fashion uh, by any of the Gulf states. Um, it has its impact because th the possession of a nuclear capability would uh, significantly enhance um, Iran's bargaining <coughs> position um, and weight uh, on the international um, arena. Um, to put it another way, um, Iran's ambitions, and this goes back to my point about uh, whether Iran has hegemonic, uh, a hegemonic quest in, in the Gulf region. Uh, Iran's ambition uh, is to be a major player on the world scene. I think this is sometimes missed in discussions um, about um, Iran and the Gulf, Iran and the Middle East, um, and so on. It is not uh, the Gulf region that Iran is focused on but uh, a much broader um, role um, in the world and a much uh, different bargaining position um, in the world. So the way in which uh, this last uh, frame uh, impacts uh, the Iran-Gulf Gulf state um, relationships uh, is the, the, the insistence uh, by the United States um, and the willingness, sometimes eagerness, um, on the part of uh, some of the Gulf states to be part of this uh, defensive alliance um, against um, Iran's uh, uh, nuclear um, program. Um, and this has taken uh, many different uh, shapes, um, particularly in the past um, few months, um, as the U.S. and to some, well, the European community um, and a number of other countries um, have, uh, have tried to rev up uh, the, uh, uh, the program uh, for, uh, uh, for significant sanctions to be imposed uh, on, uh, on Iran. Uh, various Gulf states um, have declared their willingness, uh, prodded again by, by the US, their willingness to participate fully 
uh, in these sanctions. Uh, recently, uh, there were uh, joint statements um, issued that uh, indeed part of the reason that the sanctions and the, uh, the threat of sanctions have not been um, effective uh, on Iran uh, has to do with the fact that the Gulf states have not been included uh, in this uh, and that uh, there should now be uh, a, an alliance um, and, uh, uh, and the Gulf states should indeed be invited uh, to, uh, to enter this alliance uh, with the five plus one uh, in order to strengthen uh, the sanctions. Uh, they, uh, as you know, a big part of this is uh, persuading China uh, to, uh, uh, to go along with a sanctioned regime um, within the UN uh, Security Council. Um, and in that regard, Saudi Arabia, that currently provides, I believe, something like 11 percent of, uh, I'm sorry, about 11 percent of the, uh, the exports, of the oil exports to, uh, uh, to China are provided by Iran. And the Saudis are being urged, and I believe they're uh, they have declared conditionally their, uh, their willingness to go along to uh, pick up that slack of 11% uh, of, uh, of oil supplies to, uh, uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, to, I'm sorry, to China. Um, so th these are the three frames that bear on, on the relationship. Um, as to whether uh, the, uh, the influence of Iran is um, waning uh, or it continues, um, I think here we would need to bring the three frames together, but also significantly, in my judgment, to look at the domestic situation in Iran and how it bears uh, on its appeal uh, in the Arab world, uh, widely, you know, broadly speaking, uh, and in the, uh, in the Gulf region uh, more specifically. Uh, once again, uh, the nature of Iran's appeal uh, has been at the popular level, not at the governmental level. There are no governments in the region uh, that court Iran, that have uh, a warm, close relationship um, with Iran, with the exception if we go beyond the region of, of Syria. Uh, and uh, some non-statal groups, Hezbollah um, and Hamas. So the principal appeal of Iran has, from the very beginning, been at a different level. Uh, it has been an Islamic, a radical revolutionary Islamic appeal in one form, uh, and it has been uh, very directly related to Iran taking a very uncompromising uh, and strong position uh, in defense of the Palestinians. That has been the principal uh, appeal of uh, the Iranian model uh, in this region and in the Arab world. Um, and it's precisely that appeal that makes many of the Arab uh, heads of states and governments quite nervous. Uh, look at what has been happening just in the past few days. Uh, Iran just today issued a statement uh, saying that the Arab summit, 22 countries that are going to be meeting together, must take up the matter of uh, the current state of the Palestinian-Israeli uh, stalemate and the, uh, from their point of view, the aggressive uh, uh, policies of, uh, of Israel. Um, in, uh, in the West Bank and specifically um, in Jerusalem that, you know, the Arab uh, uh, states must respond uh, effectively to this. Obviously, uh, this kind of talk, this kind of posture uh, has great appeal uh, still um, in, uh, in many parts um, of, the, uh, of the Arab world and, uh, and in the Gulf uh, region. Um, however, um, and, well, this, however, does not apply to this proposition. That will continue. Uh, at the same time, uh, one should look at developments um, inside of Iran. And I think one specific way in which the most recent developments uh, 
the post-election um, crisis uh, bear on the relationship between um, Iran and the Gulf states, and indeed uh, beyond, um, has to do with the question of the legitimacy of the, uh, of the Iranian uh, state. Um, I'm not talking about the Republican, if you will, democratic legitimacy of the state, which has been blown uh, by the huge fraud uh, that took place um, in the elections. Uh, but uh, that is not something uh, that uh, would uh, uh, be objected to by any of the um, Arab states, and I believe the Arab populations are uh, our understanding of that kind of uh, a lack of uh, legitimacy. The thing that matters, and matters a lot, it seems to me, uh, is that Iran has <coughs> been gradually losing, the regime in Iran has been losing its Islamic legitimacy, that is, its claim to being a revolutionary, popular, uh, democratic, uh, Islamic uh, regime and an example or state uh, uh, or republic um, uh, perhaps unique uh, in, the, in the Muslim world in, in, in that regard uh, as a radical uh, and yet democratic and popular uh, uh, regime. Uh, now that appeal uh, is beginning to, uh, to wane. Uh, one sees um, examples of this even uh, in some statements, rather subtle statements, by uh, leaders of Hezbollah. Uh, initially, uh, Sheikh Nasrullah came out with a very positive statement immediately after the election of uh, Ahmadinejad. But he uh, seemed to moderate that uh, somewhat in the uh, three or four days um, after when the results came out uh, and admitted <coughs> that Iran was going through um, a crisis uh, and took some distance uh, from, uh, from Iran. Well, that's, that's very important because uh, given the, the very uh, critical uh, relationship between um, Iran and, and Hezbollah, um, some similar statements have been made by other uh, uh, popular leaders uh, in, in, in the Arab world. Um, and there is a bit of reluctance now to identify with, uh, uh, with, the, with the Iranian regime as an example uh, of this uh, uh, Islamic Republican um, uh, type of um, government. The other factor that bears on, on this is that um, with uh, the outreach <laughs> of um, President Obama, the extended hand, uh, I, I believe there has been some undermining um, of Iran's position. Uh, now, admittedly, if that is only talk, uh, it's going to uh, lose its effect. But for a while, that is going back a year uh, or so, uh, that kind of talk uh, indeed undermined uh, Iran's radical appeal and uh, Iran's, uh, uh, you know, highly critical stance uh, towards the United States and its uh, uh, regional allies. So these are some of the considerations uh, that I think uh, should be uh, brought into uh, our analysis in looking at the relationship bet between Iran um, and its neighbors in the Gulf. Persian Gulf. Per well, <laughs> <laughs> if you say so, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll move to the next panelist, John Turman. Thank you, and thank you for the organizers, uh, to the organizers for including me in this. It's been quite interesting and, uh, and valuable, especially the, the three amigos here. That I like that image, although, you know, the, the film, The Three Amigos, the last one, is maybe not quite so complimentary. Um, <coughs> I'm going to throw out just a few ideas uh, that relate to um, sources of stability and instability over the next uh, number of years in, uh, in the Gulf region. and, and uh, I'd be interested in someone here describing to me what they mean by longer-range future. 
Um, but uh, I'll say um, uh, about 10 years on my uh, uh, range here. <coughs> um, a few years ago, I think, it, well, actually, probably now, almost 20 years ago, uh, Stanley Hoffman wrote an article in, in, in Foreign Affairs called Clash of Globalizations, uh, which I thought was a brilliant article at the time and I think holds up very well um, upon looking at it again the other day. And, and, and this idea of globalization, which you know, was on everybody's lips a few years ago and seems to have slipped a little bit uh, in its popularity, but I, but I suggest that this remains the uh, uh, one of the driving forces for change uh, throughout the world, of course, throughout the developing world and and in the Gulf, and and how this plays out, of course, is um, the, the specifics of it, of course, are, are exceptionally important in cultural terms. Um, I think uh, Hoffman had uh, politics, economics, and culture as being the three. Um, sources of the clash. Uh, in cultural terms, uh, I'd suggest that the clash comes mainly from from Western media and youth culture, as uh, Mehdi was was talking about yesterday. Um, and th this is this is more than just a surface phenomenon, though. This is this is exceptionally important driver of change, not only because these people become adults and, and uh, successful business people and professionals and so on and become important in that respect in their societies. But it is a, the, the, the rate of change, the rate of cell phone penetration, for example, just to take one example that was mentioned briefly yesterday, is just phenomenal in this region. And, and cell phones, I've come to understand quite recently, uh, given the limits of my own generational uh, profile, is um, is now really altering the developing world in, a, in an exceptionally uh, rapid way. And that is that cell phones have become sort of mini computers that people use for a lot of things. And, and uh, some of them quite positive developments, uh, economic develop, economic uh, uh, information that helps people uh, thrive in their societies, for example. But this new capability uh, in cell phones and the penetration among youth particularly brings, of course, globalized culture to these areas. And I, we, we know it's a source of friction already in many places, Iran not, not least among them. Uh, and, and states have been able to suppress uh, control to some extent um, uh, this the use of, of cell phones and of course other electronic technology for uh, for political purposes and, and and the more edgy types of cultural um, um, displays and 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 so on but um, I've, I was just having a conversation with someone at MIT a couple of days ago who has interestingly said to me that that Technology is being developed now so that cell phones and um, and internet access and so on will be autonomous from servers that cannot be controlled by the state. Now, I can't explain what he means by that technically, uh, but I thought it was a very interesting comment because I was actually asking him very specifically about Iran, if there was some way to decouple the uh, these technologies from state control. <clears throat> he said, right now there isn't, but it's just around the corner. Satellite is one thing, but he was also talking about Wi-Fi as being something that's very difficult to control from, from the state and so on, but also as having the equivalent of sort of server kind of capability um, autonomously, which I, I don't understand it, but... In the clouds. Uh, hmm? In the clouds. Well, there's, <laughs> there's actually a, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Yes, so right, that's part of it. Right, correct. And the technology already exists and it requires uh, really a small applet and everything to make yeah. a phone with the right tech technical ability. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. 
Anyway, uh, it, it, there's just that's that's a bit of a uh, digression, but I think the point is here that this this kind of technology and and what one does with it um, is going to be a very significant continued driver of globalization, of globalized culture, and challenges to uh, traditional authority and authority of the states and so on. On the other hand, you know, globalization raises expectations of all kinds, and if states do not satisfy them, uh, indeed if they reject such expectations as illegitimate, uh, then you have an explosive situation as well, potentially. Um, finally, uh, on globalization, although many of these points I'm making have to do with, with uh, uh, globalization, um, migration and diasporas, which, you know, migration has been, a, of course, a very significant part of globalization, and labor migration particularly. It's really part of a system uh, of globalization to some extent. And uh, the role of diasporas, the, the remittances were mentioned uh, prominently yesterday, but also political role of diasporas can play a very powerful um, role in the future. I'm not sure that it has so much, uh, it has with respect to Iran to some extent, I'm not so sure about the other countries in the Gulf, uh, but we've seen this in a number of other places in Africa and so on that have had political uh, conflicts of various kinds and the diaspora has played an exceptionally significant role and that of course is coupled with the communications technology <coughs> make this possible. So. Um, uh, issues of identity, which I'll, I'll address again in a moment, um, and uh, uh, the, the actual uh, uh, manifestation of migration. Um, is, it permanent mig is it permanent emigration that, that uh, creates diasporas in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere that have their own uh, political consciousness that then reflects back into the home country? Is it this guest worker phenomenon that we were discussing yesterday of tremendous scale in the Gulf, particularly uh, uh, migration, in migration to, uh, to the Gulf states? What, what kind of political consciousness do they bring and so on? This is all very fluid and, and not easy to summarize, but clearly uh, plays a very big role in the future of the region. Uh, second. A big idea, of course, is democratization, democ the democracy agenda mainly of the United States, but uh, of other actors, including Europe and, and some players in the region. Um, I'm going to read just a couple of summary uh, points made by a workshop that was held in, uh, at Stanford last year because I think they summarize it so well I couldn't do a better job. Um, the workshop explored several reasons, some structural, some circumstantial, for the recent failure of the region to achieve any sustainable progress toward democracy. Now they were talking about the Middle East more generally than the Gulf. Uh, first, the regimes have been very savvy, politically savvy and adroit in dealing with democratization pressures. They've not only adapted uh, to the pressures and changes in order to uh, in order to achieve more stability, they have organized semi-free elections that contributed to neutralizing the opposition in countries like Morocco and Jordan. The different PACs eventually worked in favor of the regime. The conditioned and well-controlled participation of some Muslim brotherhoods in Muslim brothers in in uh, parliaments functioned to tame and divide them. And the Islamists who played within the rules have been confined to a polite opposition with no prospect for real sharing of power. Uh, a second point they make is the Western endeavor to reach out and strengthen Arab civil society missed the point. The democratic actors tapped for engagement and assistance in fact had shallow roots among the real society of these countries and were often associated in the eyes of public opinion with Western imperialism. This actually verifies other studies that have been done of, of NGOs in the developing world, the ones who succeed are the ones who are very, very um, uh, savvy about connecting to the Western donors and often are products of Western universities and so on, uh, not particularly grounded in, in the indigenous culture. Um, third, no constructive dialogue has been established with the Islamist mainstream movements uh, and of course the West 
refused to talk to Hamas after its victory in 2006. Uh, fourth, the third way movements which tried to go beyond the harsh choice of either dictators or Islamists fared quite poorly in electoral competition throughout the region and have been unable to sustain even the initial momentum they generated in some countries. It'd be interesting to see how Iraq uh, fits into that combat. And finally, the war on terror by lumping together terrorist and Islamist movements has paradoxically enhanced the prestige of anti-US movements, though not necessarily Al-Qaeda, and has pitched nationalism against democratization. Uh, interesting points, which I generally tend to agree with. And I would add, then, that the, while the democratization scheme, particularly of the, of the Bush administration, seems to be at best a partial success, uh, if not uh, more on the uh, spectrum of failure, I, I think it's important to note that the rights revolution, more generally in the world, uh, will continue to nibble at the social and political constraints of many of these states in the Gulf and in the region more generally. Um, but what we've seen in some developing countries is that the, the pressure for political reform and democratization, anti-corruption measures and the like, uh, is often at odds with uh, privatization and liberalization of economies from the standpoint of stability. That is, it's very difficult to have political and economic reform, far-reaching reform, at the same time in many of these places, because stability is provided sometimes by things like uh, patronage, right? Um, democracy can be upsetting in, in any number of ways to stability, and at the same time when privatization tends to drive up unemployment, uh, often tends to be tribally based in various ways and so on. So it's an important question. There's no simple uh, depiction of it, but it's an important question to keep in mind as we think about the future of these states as well as, as um, elsewhere. Uh, yesterday, Farhad helpfully raised the issue of identity uh, through talking about citizenship. I mean, didn't, I don't know if he used the word identity, but I think that it was implicit in his discussion of inclusion and exclusion. And the question here um, is how are identities shifting and what does that mean for governance and political mobilization particularly? I mean, are identities in the region shifting? Are they becoming more um, uh, national? Are they becoming more international? Are they becoming more globalized? Um, are they losing tribal roots? Are they clinging to them in different ways? Um, how is this affected by processes of globalization? And this uh, will uh, be important for political mobilization, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, the rise of the middle class. Kristen's presentation yesterday was eye-opening. I would venture uh, to add that uh, another piece of speculation here, and that is the potential revolutionary character of the middle class. That is that we have, um, particularly in this country, I think we tend to think of the middle class as being innately conservative. Um, but, you know, revolution was invented uh, to some extent by a middle class imbued, particularly the one particularly imbued with, um, with religious zeal, right? I mean, think of Michael Walzer's Revolution of the Saints, a brilliant I think the depiction of this, it was essentially a middle class that had been imbued with uh, this strong uh, devotional uh, faith-based, as we would say today, ideology uh, that really uh, changed Europe and the United States. Um, and it's conceivable that um, this can be a major source of ongoing political change in the Gulf. Uh, that is, change will not necessarily come from the top. It will, in, in terms of reform, it will not necessarily come from the outside as pressure from the United States, from Europe, international institutions, processes of globalization, nor from the street, uh, the Arab street, but from an energized and ideologically driven middle class. It gets fed up with the way things are, are newly connected, energized through education and other um, uh, 
modern means, uh, but also has um, adopted um, Islam in, uh, as, a, as an ideological glue. You see this to some extent in Turkey, actually, um, when you think about it. I mean, Turkey has, uh, and thus far, of course, in a nonviolent way, but a very pervasive uh, change in Turkey. This is the oldest, uh, strongest, and most durable state in the region, basically, if you include Turkey in the Middle East. <coughs> and the change, changes there uh, have come about um, partly as a result of a newly energized middle class that has supported uh, Erdogan's party. Um, you know, circumstances were very ripe for this in part because of the sclerotic nature of the old, you know, the old parties and, and the military dominated state and how they were being subjected to globalization pressures at the same time. But nevertheless, it's very striking that this party, this Islamic party in this most secular state, um, has, has uh, succeeded as it has, uh, not only in gaining political power, but actually uh, beginning to transform uh, some, of the, uh, some of the pillars of, of Kemalism and, and uh, um, in fact, has basically um, um, transformed Kemalism. I think it's uh, quite, quite an important development, and one could see to some extent this happening uh, elsewhere. Um, a word about security. I think, uh, fortunately, Ambassador Dunbar has allowed, has opened this door for us, so we can <laughs> say something about security. Um, and the new idea here is about diversification, um, which you also alluded to yesterday, and and. Um, that is, as the, as, the, as the Persian Gulf states look east uh, for markets, um, as Professor Habibi said, uh, spelled out for us very well yesterday, they also, to some extent, look east for security. That is, that they tend to go hand in hand. When, when, you're, when your strongest economic relationships uh, are with China, with Japan, with South Korea, and with India, um, as they are beginning to appear to be, um, for, for many of the oil producing uh, states, uh, then security is not far behind. And in fact, the Saudis have sought very explicitly security relationships with India in particular, to some extent with China and South Korea, but that's more in the arms dealing uh, realm. But much more specifically, a, a set of relationships with India. And India is building a very, very big navy, a very capable one. Me. And um, this is not, at this point, supplanting the United States as the principal security actor. And there's not any near-term prospect of that happening. But if you look out, here's where we get into the longer range. If you look out maybe 15 or 20 years, uh, one could really see the, the, the key security relationship for the Saudis and the other GCC states, particularly as being India or at least a growing role for India. <coughs> and how that affects other issues um, uh, having to do with governance and rights and so on is, is an interesting one to think through. Uh, I will just make a, a little note about climate change. It was raised yesterday, and, and, and we didn't really discuss it much. Um, those projections that Judith was showing about, about oil consumption and exporting, uh, I think is really, uh, you know, is conventional thinking, and it may be true, it's impossible to say, but it's also quite conceivable that climate change, um, or I should say climate change policies, will alter that, that steady line up of, of oil exports from the Gulf to places like China. Japan and India and so on. <coughs> it, it, almost impossible to predict at this point, but China at least finally seems to be taking the, these challenges seriously. They're building a lot of fast trains, they're building electric cars, they're doing a lot of things. And of course, as a, as a uh, largely command economy in these, res in these respects, um, 
who knows where it will lead as far as their oil consumption is concerned. I think it's something to think through. I don't, I don't have any, oops, I need to send a projectile out there, aren't you? <laughs> um, but in any case, I think it's worth keeping an eye on and, and it poses an interesting set of questions about, about predict, predictability. Of course, it also plays into the issue of peak oil and whether or not these states are actually reaching limits of their productive capacity. Finally, uh, on political mobilization, um, I, I've mentioned it a couple of times. What forms of political mobilization pose challenges to the Gulf states? Uh, if the contest over citizenship and belonging, for example, is one of exclusion and inclusion, uh, that is a very potent formula for political violence, for example. I mean, there's a school of thought that uh, is pretty empirically uh, based, I think, uh, that says social exclusion is one of the main drivers of, of terrorism. Um, and um, if, if that continues to be the state of play in some of these states, uh, then that, that certainly raises the, the specter of, of that kind of instability. Uh, at the very least, it'll be an engine of political friction, uh, this exclusion, social exclusion, political exclusion. Uh, women's mobilization is another example of something that is clearly on the horizon, is happening, is happening in Iran. Uh, there's some, been amazing things of women organizing, not, not just as part of the Green Movement, but actually prior to that uh, in Iran. And, uh, signs of it elsewhere. It's, it's, uh, it, of course, it's powerful because it reaches into every home. It's not class-based. It's not necessarily tribally based. Um, it is uh, it, the exclusion of women from, from political power is, uh, depending on your interpretation of these things, is, is religiously sanctioned to some degree. So this creates frictions with traditional elites based on uh, basing their legitimacy on Islam, um, and therefore is all the more explosive as a result of these, these dynamics. So um, again, this, this is partly a result of globalization. It's partly a matter of uh, women, for example, in Iran being, as I think a couple of people have mentioned, uh, more uh, educated than men. Uh, at the uh, college level and so on. So, it, you know, there, there are these processes that are occurring that just do seem inexorable in some way. Very hard to predict how they manifest ultimately, but uh, it, it's happening in one form or another. And then finally, um, on, uh, I, I haven't talked about Iraq, which is something that has um, uh, taken up a lot of my time over the last few years, uh, but uh, the one thing I would say about Iraq with relevance to this workshop is that um, it has created whatever you make of the Iraq war and the outcome uh, and, the, and the extraordinary um, uh, costs of the Iraq war, human and financial costs, it has created in all likelihood a network of violence entrepreneurs that exist now in this region, just as you know we've heard about uh, Bosnia and Chechnya and Algeria and other struggles, Afghanistan most prominently, and now uh, Iraq, a long war involving a lot of people and a lot of violence. And the question is, where do they go back to if they have been there? What is the, um, uh, what are the consequences for uh, other countries in the region? Of course, what are the consequences for Iraq itself? Very hard to say, but certainly not a, uh, a happy note to end on because I think it, 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 it certainly connotes more violence, political violence and instability, uh, at least in the next decade or so. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a <coughs> procedural comment. I think the term, the term three amigos was created by Judith when she was fed up with Richard, Ali, and me <laughs> in a conference in Washington. But thank you for that term, we, we like it. Um, my <laughs> no, that was before the last movie. <laughs>
But uh, I'm proud to be part of the Three Amigos, two of my most dear friends. Uh, my comments actually is compliment what uh, uh, my two friends here have expressed, especially the, some of the comments that, uh, that John mentioned. I'm concerned historically uh, as a social scientist with the issue of uh, underclass exclusion. And some of the comments I made yesterday point, point out to that. And I, I'm, I'm basis of my own values and uh, as well as what I study as a social scientist, I'm particularly struck by this notion of why certain groups on the basis of uh, ethnicity, class, gender, racial reasons, uh, are, have this problem of, of being quote unquote normal citizens. Why is it that their citizenship is so fractured? Uh, what forms of social contracts the Gulf states have made with very different groups of people, including those who have been uh, left out from, from the system. John mentioned uh, immigration uh, outside. I mean, the brain drain phenomena is, is very much a case. I mean, Iran is a particularly notable example of that. But throughout the period, and trying to connect that to some of the best social science writing on that, I think of this great book by late Albert Hirschman, uh, who talked about exit, voice, and loyalty. And we see examples of, of exit when things don't go well, and the voice that could be mobilized, and, and we've seen the, the proper and improper versions of that, some violent, some, some, some mainstream, and the question of loyalty. Uh, now, also, I believe John mentioned that the question of, of migration uh, into the Gulf and outside uh, workforces uh, it's been dramatically changed, but the problem has been there for a long, long time. Of course, we know that in Afghanistan, when the Soviets occupied it, the population was about uh, 15 million at that time, and about one-third of the population migrated to Iran and to Pakistan. That's all correct, due to the horrible Soviet occupation. But when one looks at the history of that before the occupation of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union, there were a million Afghan workers in Iran. They were economic migrants. Later on, economic and political migration became conflated and, and became one. I also don't want to interfere in my dear friend Richard's uh, area of expertise. We talk about all the Syrians in Lebanon, you know, more recently, but they had been there for a long, long time as, as workers, as professionals, and so forth. So uh, this is this group of people who have fractured citizenship, it's a concern, I think will have a very important impact on politics of the Gulf area, internally and externally. What I keep seeing, but I don't know when this become an, become an explosion, is that there is a process of change and transformation in the Gulf. I think it's very dramatic, no matter what indices we look at, uh, and it's connected uh, to, uh, to try to uh, repeat what Ali said, to both endogenous and exogenous factors, not only for Iran, but also for the, for the whole Gulf period. I see the changes as uh, dramatic and more changes to be very much in part and parcels uh, of, of the game. Who are the leaders of these changes? What groups are pushing it more? It's a debatable proposition. It's possible, I think as John mentioned, that actually the middle class may become a quote unquote a force of major changes. I'm not sure I would use the word revolutionary, even though Michael Walzer's book, of course, was a, one of the greatest uh, books on that subject. But the middle class could be a significant force of change. And as we discussed it yesterday, we have to see to what degree do the, the forces go there. Now, let me look more briefly again, not only at the, uh, at, at the changes that are taking place all around, but what are the more clear-cut changes that I see based on external outside forces, and what are the ones that are developing from the inside? Obviously, globalization, global culture, and so forth is a very major factor. And we don't know the dimensions in terms of mass media and intercommunication. Uh, we had a presentation on that yesterday. But I think it's just the sky is the ceiling on that. Things are changing so fast and so, so, so dramatically and clearly, we don't know what they will lead to. I would assume much of that is positive, but the judgment on that issue remains, remains to be seen. So media, internet, and so forth, then of course, we have higher education. It's, 
We, all of us as educators, have thought that education is one of the principal agents of socialization. And it will continue to be that. But how quickly, how uh, forcefully, can imported educational institutions have a major impact on the politics and domestic affairs of these areas? We hear about chaos, we hear all the activities in the, in the, in the UAE and so forth. And they seem to have some impact, obviously, <coughs> on some of the dominant values of the society. I've been following very closely the issue of, of chaos and the reactions in King Abdulaziz University, Saudi Arabia, which began with what, seven billion endowment, and the question of the mixing of the genders uh, in that institution and some reactions that some uh, clerics made to that, some negative reaction, and a very, very sharp counter-reaction by the Saudi monarch. Uh, well, the point is that that could go on. We know who is more powerful, who is less powerful. But to what extent will this, I think, very, very novel change in Saudi Arabia will have the long-term impact on gender relations, relationship? And how will it empower women in that society, other places, for change, uh, for better change? So there are all these things that are happening we should keep an eye on. And then in terms of internal forces uh, uh, involved, of course, Richard and I and Ali others have been a civil society activists for a long time. We believe, obviously, civil society as an agent of change and democratization. But I'm also constantly being reminded about the power of the states in the region. As important as civil society institutions are, and to me are extremely important, but we don't see any reduction in a kind of a very systematic way of the power of the states in the region. So they have the resources, they have the, the monopoly over means of uh, collective violence, and they continue to be important, but that doesn't mean in any form or shape I'm losing hope uh, for civil society institutions. And in, in I think in due course, some of them will have a special impact of that. Well, what specifically of these groups? One is the private sector. We know from our history of, of Europe and the West and the process of democratization what an important role bourgeoisie played in changes and democracy in the West. Well, the problem with the Middle East is that the bourgeoisie is dependent on the state. But still, there may be some arena of change, some areas of change that, that could eventually put some limits on the arbitrary exercise of power by the authoritarian regime. This remains to be seen. It's a question mark, but I think we should not just dismiss it, that the private sector will not be a force in, in, in a more of a balanced system. Then, of course, very important is the youth of the Middle East. Uh, we have talked, we have, we have, uh, uh, some statistical evidence presented yesterday that uh, most of the Middle Eastern societies, youth are the dominant population. But we also know from a comparative advantage, that youth in the world have been in the forefront of democratization. And we know very well from the events in Iran how important the youth were in, in the green movement and so forth. And there will be for some time future. But how the phenomenon of youth can coalesce into organized activities through evolutionary processes that will impact authoritarianism, again, is a question mark that remains to be seen. We know will happen in some day and time, but when and how, it is a big question mark. Then connected to that, but I think extremely significant, and one of the questions we had yesterday from someone in the audience was about women in the Middle East. Uh, the increase in literacy has had a very important impact. Uh, to me, some of the most important elements in gender equality is economic uh, autonomy of the female. We also have seen the impact of the level of education of the mothers with population control. Iran has many bad things going with it these days politically, but on that issue of population control, the record is phenomenal. It's as good as West European countries and so forth. And the regime may take uh, uh, credit for that, but in reality has been and one of the closest things to a social science law we have is, is the mothers education and its relationship to the number of children. Well, women in Iran are highly educated. Women in the many of the Middle East countries are getting that way. They're still not quite the same level as, as Lebanon and Iran and Turkey and so forth. 
and Egypt is a big problem. But nevertheless, this is going to be a very significant force of change, both in population control in an area where population is increasing rapidly, both indigenous and those of the, of the migrant population and otherwise. And I hope and I, I think we will see that women also become a very significant force of accountability for the regimes, especially as they move into the economic realm and as they begin to have pressures politically. So what do we should expect in the next decade or so to see in the Gulf region and the Middle East? Again, change, more change, and more change. I think the demands for citizenship rights and collective rights of the excluded will become more and more articulated and, and will become part and parcel of that. There will be a, a demand for individual liberties as well as for political participation. I think the regimes of the area in an evolutionary process will begin to include these or they're going to have a serious problem in the future. I'm going to stop there and thank you. Hi, well, I want to thank you all, and I think you've you've really done a great job of, of like Dr. Ali Benazizi, kind of providing the the frames which you can look at the the kind of containers for ideas, and then a lot of the processes, both Farhad Akazmi and John Chairman, looking at sort of the processes that do that, but. But I was wondering if we could introduce a little bit more concretely what some of the ideas are or the political movements that are there um, and see how they interact with these different things. Um, and the one in particular that hasn't been brought up at all and that's so important in the Gulf region right now that I think we'd be remiss if we don't even speak about it is the rise of Salafism or Salafi movements um, in the Gulf states. So I was wondering if we could explore just a little bit the way Salafi movements interact with all these beautiful processes and frames that you've set up. And just to bring out um, one in particular, um, of course, uh, Salafi movements have their own dynamic, which is quite different, really, than other than Muslim Brotherhood-oriented uh, movements. And one thing that's distinctive about them, of course, was is the sort of that they were a movement uh, within Islam. I mean, like where Muslim Brotherhood was kind of looking at interaction between Islam and the West a lot. I think Salafi movements are really concerned about the borders of Islam and proper Islamic uh, orthopraxy and ideas and that sort of thing. And one consequence of that, of course, has been uh, the um, uh, hostility. I think it's fair to say to Shia. Um, and the kind of exclusion of Shia. And so when you, when you look at sort of uh, w one thing, just kind of link it into things that you talked about, um, as we've seen um, Iran kind of rise in the region, and I think it's just as you described it, a lot of it wasn't even through the actions of Iran itself. It's just sort of the structures that fell and elevated Iran and kind of made the, but it, it changed the perception of maybe something that Iran was doing already and kind of pursuing other nuclear weapons. But I think it's important to look at how that interacted with this similar rise in Salafi movements, which provided sort of an intellectual frame for even looking at Iran in a much more suspicious manner, I think, and, and provides sort of content for escalating that kind of rhetoric of, of conflict between the two. And at the same time, because these realities were happening, I think it also fed the Salafi movements. Um, so there's sort of an interactive dynamic there, a polarizing dynamic that I think has, has led to the joint rise of the two of them. And just one other thing to link it to processes, Salafi movements um, have been very, very good at using a lot of these technological things you talked about. I mean, we need to remember that all these Western um, technologies don't just transmit Western ideas. I mean, Salafi movements are very good at using internet, blogs, um, SMS to campaign, these sorts of things, also just audio tapes and that kind of thing. So that they really, it does constitute, there's no denial of that, a very global movement, a globalizing movement in its, in its own right, which has impacts well within all of the states of the Gulf and also well beyond the Gulf. Um, One other small thing, I, I can't get into it too much, but if any of you uh, know about this, I, I was very curious about your idea that you said that uh, Iran is losing its sort of um, Islamic legitimacy as an Islamic revolutionary idea. And I think that that definitely has to be true through the current interaction. But I've been very curious, at least the initial kind of discussions that I had with some of the Shia movements in the Gulf states, particularly in Bahrain, talking to people in Awifaq, and I haven't spoken to them more recently, but in the initial conflict that happened with the Green Movement, 
I was really struck by how the populations in the Gulf, the Shia populations, really stood on the side of Ahmadinejad. And I'm wondering if anyone can explain that to me, because I, I was a bit surprised knowing sort of the content of the Wefaq movement and what it's tried to represent inside of Bahrain. I mean, I thought at least an intellectual content, they would be more sympathetic with sort of the green movement, but that didn't seem, at least with individuals, and I, I shouldn't speak because I don't know really officially what position they've taken. Um, it didn't seem to be the case. So I'm just sort of curious about this relationship, if anyone could speak about the intellectual relationship between the intellectual currents that take place inside of Iran and with Shia movements inside the Gulf states, because it's, it's, it's huge. I mean, obviously, a lot of these leaders, you know, I, I met with Sheikh Ali Salman, he studied in Qom. I mean, a lot of these leaders studied there, and so they're linked intellectually to a lot of the same currents in Iran. So if anyone has ideas about that, I'd, I'd love to hear about them. Thanks. Thank you. Respond to that. Um, very briefly, I think, with respect to the Salafi movement, at least to the extent that the Saudis were initially behind the Salafi movement, um, I believe that there is some retrenchment um, in Saudi Arabia about that. Um, I think there is an increasing realization that this is a very dangerous thing, you know, all those madrasas. Um, that were promoted, um, and the real policy changes that are taking place um, right now, um, the, again, based on the realization that ultimately this movement can come back and its main target could become the Saudi state itself. Now, in terms of the, the ideas, the, the mix of ideas that you mentioned, what are they? Um, you emphasized um, the persistence of the Salafi movement. Um, I believe that another idea um, that is um, growing and partly from Iran but not exclusively from Iran is the idea of secularism. That is, uh, not secularism needless to say for this audience in the sense of the separation, you know, uh, or secularization, let's say, um, of uh, uh, public life or certainly private life. Uh, but the notion that indeed religion is best protected within a secular arrangement. This is a thesis which uh, more than anyone else, I think Abdullahi and Naim has put forward, um, that uh, he argues, as everyone I suppose knows, that um, as a Muslim believer, he finds that a secular state, a state that is neutral towards religion, in fact provides the best framework um, for Islam. Now, the same kind of thinking is gaining ground in Iran itself. And what I emphasized earlier on regarding the the, the loss of legitimacy, the Islamic legitimacy, of the regime in Iran centers on this issue. That is, it centers on the objections, on the protests um, of the high clergy in Iran about the actions and the postures and the policies um, of the government um, as, as official uh, or, or the protectors of official religion of, of Islam. I think that idea is something that I would say is going to find greater currency um, in the Middle East. And I personally uh, pin my own hopes for <laughs> change and transformation um, on that idea. By no means does that exclude or downplay the role of religion, but the idea that religious authority should not be vested in the state because we see in part the consequence of that as the militarization of the state so that now the revolutionary guards regard any kind of insult or opposition to themselves, to the military, as a violation or as an, as a, you know, as a, uh, as an insult to Islam. Well, you can imagine how that goes over um, with those who have a genuine interest in the protection of religion. Let me make a quick Islam. comment on this. Yes. Very quick, very brief. I, I, I do agree with Ali completely, and it was very articulate. But secularism, as you very well know, has gotten a bad name 
in much of the Islamic world. I remember Gilles Capel's first book about Egypt, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse was secularism. So I think what Ali is saying is very accurate. Let's forget the word secularism. And don't think of the French model, laicism, you know. But some way where you respect on a personal basis your religion, your value, at the same time you keep the state somewhat neutral. I think this is the area where both theoretically, not only among the Shi'i modernists, but also among the Sunnis, uh, theoretically and actually in terms of popular acceptance, is increasing quite rapidly. At the same time that Salafism is increasing. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Just to uh, uh, intervene a little bit on the, I hope we're going to get to the question of the Shia in the, uh, the reaction. Uh, a quick intervention on, on um, Ali's points, and then I hope we'll get to the, what you, the questions you raised about the Shia. You mentioned um, you, you saw policy shift in the Saudi government vis-a-vis -vis Salafism, but I didn't catch what those were. Probably I wasn't paying attention, but can you cite kind of chapter and verse on what they've done? One specific case, that zakat should be channeled through the state uh, departments. That, you know, this idea that you, that's very important, you know, I mean, it's materially important uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the, the so-called Saudi businesses or Saudi potentates uh, cannot and should not uh, be supporting uh, groups and efforts outside of Saudi Arabia uh, without the, you know, the filters uh, of the state. That's just one example, yeah. Mm. Are we going to hear about the shoe? Uh, yes, I hope we will. But l the lady has been waiting in her account. Hello, good morning. Uh, John, my question is to you. You said uh, socially exclu social exclusion leads to and raises the factor of terrorism. Would you like to comment regarding Pakistan? The research um, that I was thinking about really has to do more with Europe, in fact. Uh, uh, people like Mark Sageman and, and others who have looked at um, and I, and, and I don't think they would put it specifically in terms of social exclusion, but it's, but it's part of the sort of bundle of, uh, of reasons that they would put forward for, for, um, uh, for example, in, in the UK, uh, the, the Muslims who have been involved in some of the attacks of the last few years have tended to be second and third generation uh, immigrants, uh, not necessarily doing badly economically, but clearly, as is the way of, <coughs> still, of England, uh, socially, you know, feeling socially excluded from, uh, from society. And this, I think, was also true of the, Span of the Madrid bombing as well, the people who were involved in the Madrid bombing. So, um, and, and he, Sageman had done a very extensive set of interviews, uh, surveys um, uh, beyond those two. And I think there's some other evidence as well in Germany and elsewhere. The, um, the application to the region itself, I think, is uh, a little harder to sort out, in part because of the, of the, the, you know, the sort of different social structure and, and the role of, of uh, Islam and these, you know, as, as Kristen was pointing out, this is sort of recent movements of um, more fundamental uh, takes on Islam and so on, which are to some extent reactions to the West, not necessarily uh, uh, manifestations of social exclusion. So it's a little, it's a little trickier. And with Pakistan, I just don't know well enough to comment at all. Right. Yes. Um, my question kind of tags on to that. Um, it has to do with globalization, and we're all surmising uh, what the change will be that globalization brings. Um, so in this way, um, I think as globalization is supposed to bring, or is uh, it, people think it brings on modernization or individualism or 
um, autonomy within the ind individual, but if people are looking for a sense of belonging, essentially, um, social integration, um, could globalization be a way to dilute that sense of belonging, or will people look to other ways? Maybe their Islamic identity, their national identity, their tribe, whatever else. So in that way, could it regress what we think of when we think of modernism or modernity? Well, it's an awfully big question. Um, my, my take on it would be that I think that, that for example, in, in, in the growth of some militant groups, whether or not they're violent per se, um, has been in part a reaction to <coughs> excuse me, modernity and, and modernization in the region whether we call it globalization, the process of globalization or not. I mean, it's modernization. And um, uh, the, the lack, of, lack of social cohesion um, that that brings. It's also, you know, capitalism also does this. I mean, capitalism is dynamic, but it also breaks down, breaks down traditional forms of, um, of social organization. And, um, so, so these processes, I think, have, I think, it, it, I'm not sure this would be disputed. Particularly, it's a question of how extensive it is. These processes bring to, bring uh, a, a kind of a reaction that does uh, can go in any number of ways. One of which is toward uh, uh, an em an embrace of traditional norms and forms of authority and so on. And, and that's why I think, for example, women's um, empowerment, women's liberation, however you want to describe it, uh, as, as, has been sort of creeping into various parts of the developing world. This is a very, very profound challenge uh, to, uh, you know, traditional male authority. And, and that's a, that's a that will drive people back toward, as it has here to some extent. I mean, it has everywhere. It's, you know, you see the the rise of of a uh, Christian fundamentalists in this country. A lot of it has to do with the role of women and, and and other forms of challenges to traditional authority. And I think it's true in that region as well. Can I make a quick comment on that? If I, can? I think this is a very important question you raise, and we as scholars and observers have a causality problem here in terms of yeah. what exclusion, economic, social, and political, what is the processes by which that becomes collective and organized and then affects the state. The lines are not so clear. We could have individual sense of frustration at social exclusion, economic exclusion, but does they adapt together as an organized collective sense of exclusion directed against groups that we believe to be the cause of that. So the lines are not so clear cut. I think we are all correct to talk about the problems of exclusion and so forth, but the processes by which this has a, a result in real action, revolutionary or evolutionary, it's an open question. I think, I'm sorry, can I just in on that? I think that what you're saying um, is important because um, as Professor Tierman was saying, sometimes education and people who are very well educated and have a lot of economic prosperity are still involved in terrorist activity. So yeah. perhaps e economic um, and education, economic prosperity and education are not effective ways to socially integrate people in that way. Hi. Yeah, Professor Yaffe and then mm. Ambassador. Yeah. There, if there are others, go no. I, I, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I have to leave. No, no, you're first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your first. Thank I you. meant others. I, uh, thank uh. you. I want to get back to the question of the Shia because I think we've avoided it or skirted around it, <laughs> and that's the wrong thing to do. It's a very important question. But who they are and what they want is something that everyone has trouble coming to terms with. Bahrain Shia are not all Persian in origin. Um, the majority are, are of Arab origin. Yes, there are family connections. The Gulf is a highway and has been, as Larry Potter keeps teaching us, for what, thousands of years. But I think in a way they're the pawns of many people who are watching to see what are they going to do? Which way will they jump? 
or will they not go at all? So they're pawns of Iran. And here, I think Ahmadinejad and the uh, Rev Guard, the different speakers of, from the current centers of power like to remind the Gulf Arabs, those Shia monarchs that they really don't uh, like very much, if you want, that um, we have assets. You really need to listen to us and respect because when they get when when these Iranians get cranky, they like to remind them that they have those assets, the Shia, and of course the assumption is they're all going to be loyal, they're all going to be pro-Iran, they're all going to be a source of this kind of opinion in those countries, and therefore could be a problem. It's a crude kind of a statement, but I think, hey, Ahmadinejad is nothing if not unsubtle. <laughs> Put it that way. They're pawns of their own governments. Because the governments like to use them, and in a sense, they're sometimes reinforced by what the Iranians are saying. Certainly, that's got to be true in Saudi Arabia. What is happening to the Shia there? My question, again, would be, what do the Shia want? I think that uh, as little as we know, and there really is very little written, especially by people in the region yet, that they want to be accepted and be part of the Saudi system. They're Saudi citizens. How many of these Gulf, of Gulf Shia want to be like Iran? And I remember one of the first pieces I wrote on this region was on Bahrain's Shia after the revolution. Did they all want to be, you know, follow that model? And the answer was no, at least in, in my mind. They, uh, there is another very strong influence, and that is the fact that uh, Shiism, as, as defined by Iran, has not been the dominant force, I, in my opinion, it is Iraq's Shiism. It is Sistani and his predecessors that have, I think, received religious loyalty. Um, uh, in the, if you look at the academies of Najaf, yeah, Khomeini was there, but there are also all of the leading Shia elements of the Gulf were there as well. Uh, and I think like Fadlallah in Lebanon tended to be uh, more of the Dawa type persuasion rather than of the uh, Iranian-backed um, groups. Um, also, the presence in the Gulf. I mean, Iraq is important, I think. You don't talk enough about Iraq. I have to tell you this. <laughs> um, because it's important. There are also a lot of ex-Bathists in the Gulf, Sunnis, who are accepted and receive regime support uh, and are becoming are becoming integrated into some of these societies to help boost. I think I mentioned that yesterday about Bahrain. But I think the, the point is that what happens in Iraq is very important. It's the next, it's the next leg, if you will, in this uh, this sense of sh building Shia identity and and participation. Not knowing how this election is going to turn out, uh, even now we still don't know. It's almost becoming like uh, our two thousand election. <laughs> um, but the. The point is, Iraq is a democracy, and democracy just doesn't mean that the largest group, oh, it's the Shia, are always going to dominate government. They don't. They don't all vote. And I think we see that in this election, where votes have gone <coughs> for non-Iranian-backed, non uh, secular. There is a profound change going on there, but it's also going to feed the sense of identity. And what we see the Shia have accomplished in Iraq, why can't we have that here? You mean in the United States? You mean. <laughs> <laughs> Can I very briefly comment on that? Uh, this is this has yeah. gone beyond. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, you you answered um, many of the questions that you posed. I think <laughs> very Sorry well, but uh, but very quickly, uh, one could uh, talk about the Shia as minority or minorities, and as I think you correctly pointed out, they want to have full political participation and you know, respect for their status and rights in places like Saudi Arabia. That's one problem. Now, Shia as a transnational political force, you know, the Shiite crescent and, and all of that, I'm very skeptical about it, you know, as I believe you are. All right. But let me just elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, the question in that regard is whether the Iranian government represents Shiism as a religion, right? right. That is very much in question today. Right. Why does Khamenei, as the supreme leader, after all, that's a very important 
sounding position. Does, <laughs> does he have any Shi'i followers outside of Iran? Okay, not political followers, of course. You know, there are many people who are on the dole, right? But but they're not religious followers. Does he have religious followers inside of Iran? Look at all the major, you know, uh, grand ayatollahs in Iran. There are about 12 or 13 of them. And how many of them have taken exception to his actions and his postures and, you know, uh, and so on and so forth, right? All right. And as you correctly pointed out, if there is some semblance of stability in Iraq, indeed, Iraqi Shiism will be a competitor to Iranian Shiism and possibly have the upper hand because of Najaf and right now because of Sistani, who has a much greater following um, among the Shi'is uh, uh, around the world. And finally, just look at Iran's support for Hezbollah as well as Hamas. Is that a Shi'i thing or is it an ideological thing? That's where I think we would agree. <laughs> right. Yes. Hi, it's a question for um, Professor Banwazizi. Uh, you mentioned in your talk about um, the importance of getting GCC Gulf states into the sanctions regime on Iran. Um, and we had, I think, Hillary Clinton just last week saying how it's important that Iran doesn't become a nuclear power, um, a nuclear weapon power. Do you think a sanctions regime is effective in this response, in this area of um, preventing Iran from, or changing Iran's behavior in, in trying to um, get nuclear weapons? Or are there any other policies that you think the US or the international community could follow that would be more effective than sanctions? Maybe other panelists could uh, comment on that as well. Uh, my point there was actually a, a much more modest and, and, and simple one, uh, and that is that as you know, uh, Secretary Gates and um, uh, an Under Secretary of State, whose name I forget now, had been to Saudi Arabia uh, recently. Um, and in their discussions with the Saudis and with some of the other Gulf states, specifically in the Manama uh, dialogue last year, for the first time, the notion that an effective sanction regime would have to include the Gulf states in it. That is, in the discussions that would lead to the development of the sanctions. That's a very new idea, you know, that, the f that we should have something more than five plus one at the point of the articulation of what that sanction regime is going to be. And I use that as an example of the Gulf states wanting to play, play along, if you will, uh, in, the, uh, in the movement to uh, forestall uh, Iran's acquisition uh, of a nuclear capability. Yes, best. <laughs> is there anybody who hasn't asked? Yeah. You have yeah. No. And neither is he. All right, then I'll come back to you. <laughs> right. Um, I was wondering if uh, members of the panel can comment on how the um, experience of Arabs in their interactions with Israel and the fact that they have been defeated several times has had an impact on cultural developments and the development of the um, uh, cultural trends in the, in the region. In particular, I'm concerned about the sense of humiliation uh, that might, might have arisen from repeated defeats, especially the 1967, and the sense of helplessness in watching through satellite TV programs of what is going on in uh, Gaza, for example. Good for you. Well, um, my understanding of it is that it is a um, Gaza, uh, particularly uh, recently, is um, uh, exceptionally important, not to the not to the political leadership necessarily the Gulf, although important, but not um, <coughs> sort of game changing for them. But for the for the ordinary citizen of of uh, Arab Gulf states and other um, uh, not 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 limited to Arabs, I think, but Muslims more generally. Um, 
has been a very powerful uh, sense of not humiliation so much as outrage. And it, it hasn't really, it hasn't manifested really as, you know, greater political activity or militant activity outside. But um, one constantly sees, and I think most interestingly now, it has, it sees references to it. And I think this recent statement by uh, General Petraeus is really even the most remarkable, uh, it's not a manifestation of Arab sentiment, but it's reflected, right, from, from, from U.S. perception that this is now uh, a mortal threat to um, what is his first priority, which is the protection of his own troops. Right? And I saw this also, I was telling Ali, I think, yesterday, that uh, Admiral Fallon was at our center last year as a visiting fellow, and he had expressed similar things, some of them publicly, um, about the lack of, of Israeli movement toward a, toward a settlement. So that, that had, now that's of course very much from an American perspective, but I think that if it's bubbling up that high, you know, then, then, it's, then it's very significant. It just hasn't, it's, it's very hard to say how, it, how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, now plays out in the culture. I mean, it's almost, in the Arab culture, Arab political culture, because it's, it's, it's been around for so long. I mean, now this is just a given of the political life of many of these countries, that this, is, this outrage or this catastrophe has, has occurred uh, to their brethren or their cousins or however you want to put it. Um, it's, and so on, on the one hand, you could say settling the problem, if that's conceivable now, um, in, in, uh, in Israel, Palestine, uh, would, have a, would have a salutary effect on lots of other relationships, particularly with the West and in the region. On the other hand, maybe not. Maybe it doesn't actually, maybe it's just a sort of emotional trope that is um, like, uh, you know, other countries, other cultures have similar things. I mean, in Iran, it's the, you know, it's the 53 coup, maybe, is this something that they'll never get over. I want to add a historical yeah. dimension to what yeah. John says. I mean, if, if you, because you, you mentioned 67. Yeah. Well, that was the dramatic episode in the psyche of not just the Arabs, but many of the Muslims and, and so forth. If you look at the writings done in Egypt and Syria after the 67 war, it's extremely, what you are saying, humiliation, the, mm -hmm. the sense of, you know, that every regime we've had in the past in these areas have failed us, and how could, you know, we lose so dramatically in such a short time. And I think in some form or fashion, actually at one time Richard and I did a joint article related to that at one time, uh, in some ways that also began to contribute, in, I cannot say exactly one-to-one, -one, to some of the rise of Islamism. Yeah. You know, and then, of course, there were historical facts, Iran Revolution, Afghanistan, Bosnia, et cetera, et cetera. But it, now I think it's perhaps more diffuse. But I also give one example. When I was part of the Jerejian Commission, the U.S. Government Commission on Public Diplomacy in the Middle East, we went all over, talked to common women and men in the area, and they were taught the issue that's in the psyche of most of them, aside from the fact that we support authoritarian regimes, et cetera, et cetera, is always a just resolution of Palestinian-Israeli issue. And, and I think with the Gaza and all that, that issue has not lost its significance in the psyche of the people. Politically, of course, it's a ball. You, know, you throw it, kick it this way or that way. So it remains, but it's hard to put a concrete uh, feature to it. Yes. Hi. Uh, uh, this is a question on secularism, uh, as was mentioned before. Um, in my own work, I have uh, compiled a lot of uh, uh, expressions of popular culture uh, that are part of the underground you know, popular culture in Iran, where the very institution of um, uh, uh, Rohaniyat, you know, the clergy in Iran, uh, um, are being ridiculed in these. Uh, either these are jokes or these are uh, video clips, performances. Um, and uh, um, 
So uh, at, a, at that level, I am sort of I'm coming to terms with it, um, and I'm also uh, somewhat familiar with writings of Eshkevari, Shabastari, and uh, Kadivar, and Surush. some other and Surush. Um, but I wanted uh, I was wondering if you could, Professor Ben Azizi, if you could um, elaborate uh, a little bit on the uh, is uh, is there any one in particular has articulated that one in the form of writing or positions, you know, um, of the, the the very position that you correctly, in my opinion, you know, pointed out, uh, that is um, uh, uh, the um, a, a proper place, f uh, a, a defense of religion would be to advocate a position which um, for the sake of religion, one has to, you know, has a sort of a neutral state with vis-a-vis -vis that. Can you point out to individuals who have articulated that uh, in a way that would, uh, would, be, would have a, an audience uh, could read and process that? A um, couple of reactions. One, at the popular level, you might be interested, and you know this, I'm sure, uh, that in Iran, there is now an expression called dina dolati, you know, this is the um, state religion or, or that sort of thing, you know. Uh, and that is counterposed to dina ma, you know, our own religion, you know. Uh, and that's very important. Can you imagine in an Islamic republic, one of whose pillars of legitimacy was the claim to the establishment of the government of God on earth, that that government would be seen as an alien and contrasted to Deen Khodemun, you know, our own religion, not, not the Deen Dolati, you know, not the state religion that they're doing. All right, that's at the popular level, which I think uh, reinforces what you were saying um, earlier on. But uh, what I was referring to was the distance of some of the highest ranking clerics in Iran, including Montazeri. And you know, by all accounts, he was the giant you know, among all the Ayatollahs. He wrote the constitution of the republic. You know, he was the, the key person in the drafting of that constitution, who said explicitly that this is not what we had in mind. And more and more, he would not go as far as saying that I'm a secularist, but more and more he hinted at you know, the separation and the autonomy of the religious uh, order. I mean, that's what I mean by, by secularism, I, as I pointed out. I don't mean the exclusion or the pushing out of, uh, of religion and so on. But let me also say that the, the secularist movement in these terms is not unique to Iran. <coughs> One sees this in intellectual debates uh, elsewhere, you know, among Muslim intellectuals. To be sure, this is not yet an idea that has taken, if you will, among the masses and so on and so forth. But I personally believe that change, I used to believe that change comes from the bottom and from the masses. I no longer believe in that. I believe that change indeed comes from the intellectual vanguards in these societies. I mean, look at the experience of the Iranian revolution, look at the experience of you know, the rise of Islam in, in Egypt and elsewhere. To be sure, then they recruit people, but the fundamental ideas begin um, with the clergy, with the intellectuals, <laughs> you know, with people who are in the vanguard, the students, you know, and, and so on. Those are the engines of change in the region that we are talking well, about. Uh, Joseph, I may add to this. Uh, I heard from uh, basically a clergy, a, a joke, um, which goes something like this. This is to the point that you made. Um, you know, in Iran, we have um, um, the representative of the Supreme Leader's office all over the place. And um, so uh, these offices are supposed to represent, you know, the Supreme Leader. And one joke goes like this, um, uh, who is God? Well, God is a uh, re representative supreme leader in disguise. <laughs> so, even, <coughs> so it's, the, it's so flipped that 
<laughs> I, I actually had a question that follows um, uh, pretty closely along that, um, which is um, uh, to ask uh, whether um, the uh, intellectuals, I completely agree with uh, Professor Badamazizi, that it is the intellectuals who uh, create a new vision of the social order that then does or does not take hold. And I had a question about one particular um, uh, vision of the social order uh, that Professor Tiernan mentioned, uh, and that is uh, whether the vision of um, the nation uh, as an alternative uh, source of legitimacy and sovereignty uh, has any play in the Gulf outside of Iran. I mean, obviously, it has tremendous, uh, a tremendous influence within Iran. Um, uh, but um, I'm reminded that a, a friend of mine who is a diplomat um, uh, in Latin America used to keep a map of the Habsburg Empire on his wall. And uh, friends who visited him in his, uh, in his, uh, uh, at the embassy would ask him you know, why he had this map of the Habsburg Empire on his wall there in Latin America. And he said, well, just as a reminder that things change. <laughs> um, and obviously what changed the Habsburg Empire was the explosion of nationalism and the embrace of this idea of the people as a source of a secular government. Um, and I'm wondering if there's any, if, if you know, there is any Bahraini nationalism, if there's any Omani nationalism, and, and by that I don't mean, you know, xenophobia, obviously, I mean uh, the establishment of this idea that there is a people, an imagined community that ought to be served rather than the emirs. I think <laughs> Professor Norton, <laughs> Norton, uh, Norton is, is, uh, <laughs> is our local let expert. Let Richard answer that. <laughs> Well, I mean, to take the specific case of uh, Bahrain, and Kristen may have something to add on this as well, I, I think the one segment of the population that does see itself as authentically uh, the national community of Bahrain is the Baharna, That's right. or the Baharna, okay. the Arab uh, Shi'i Muslims who constitute the overwhelming majority of the country who can make a very credible case that in terms of shared culture and history, uh, economic practices and so on, even, even religion aside, they really constitute a distinctive people. And, um, and certainly in their discourse, they very much distinguish themselves from, um, from these sort of new communities, including the, the uh, uh, the Khalifa, who have only been resident for 200 years, let's face it. Um, so, uh, so I think that you know there you can find sort of residual evidence of national identity. I think certainly in Kuwait, and Kristen again may want to add to this. Certainly, the Kuwaitis feel themselves to be a, a distinctive uh, population in national terms, and I think to an extent that's not shared any place else in the Gulf. Uh, that's a shared sense of national identity that transcends sectarian boundaries. I think the Kuwaitis, uh, it's fair to say, have done a better job of integrating the minority Shi'i community than, uh, than other, um, in other countries in the Gulf. But um, it's not clear that you can make similar claims on most of the other countries, the Arab states of the Gulf, with the exception of Oman, which certainly has a a distinctive sense of, of, of national purpose and identity. Christine, you want to add to that? Um, actually, I don't think I do, but I wanted to add one other thing. Well, on the Kuwait, I mean, uh, well, I think it's it's worth saying that the states actively worked to not create this sort of nationalism. They had sort of a reactionary state-building policy, which worked to not let nationalism emerge because it worked against, of course, the kind of patriarchal control of the monarchic states. Um, Kuwait, I think obviously the experience of the Gulf War was, uh, Kuwait already did have, through its specific kind of politics and the ideas that the merchants brought, and that they were able, through then the bodies, to actually embody a sort of a, a democratic experience more than the other Gulf states, I think has probably, you're right, for those reasons, has, has developed that more. Um, I, instead of adding more, though, I wanted to give a pitch uh, for a book, maybe some of you already know it, but for those who don't, who want to really get into the details of the Shia transnational politics, um, and a lot of these ideas, exactly like you said, like where do the religious aspects and the leadership of Iraq and, and playing sort of a role in, in organizing these communities, and then what role the Iranian Revolution played on that. There's a, a superb book that came out just recently by a French scholar, uh, Laurence Louis, 
So anyone who's interested in those issues who doesn't know about them, I mean, that's kind of been my guide for, for all of these issues. So. You, and then finally. <laughs> um, I just have a question about, uh, uh, I guess, Arab Gulf scholarship uh, and for the professors interacting with students that are kind of up and coming or counterparts at universities there. Um, when will we have kind of within um, conversations like this also a perspective um, from the Gulf? Because I, I've been in places like Dubai where you try and have some of these conversations and it's a very different dynamic, a tense one, a lot of defensiveness. And, and so are there scholars like this uh, out there and, and can we have conversations that kind of it seems like there's a missing voice uh, in the room? I, I, I agree. I think... <laughs> It's changing, but, there's a, but there are individuals. In fact, from Sunni Bahrainis, who sometimes express that, and others. But it's very, very difficult to have this kind of a session with the openness that we have, because as you said, I think very correctly, it's those defensive mechanisms come in very dramatically, and you very quickly begin to categorize people in different groups, you know, is this, is that, and all that. It's not that you cannot have it. We often have had it with, uh, with a scholar, uh, Arab scholars from the Gulf in the U.S. It's been never a problem. But in the locality, it's, it's a bit more difficult. I remember uh, when I was in Bahrain several years ago, and uh, there was an election first time, and many of the Shia intellectuals refusing to participate in elections. So I was asked by the U.S. Embassy to go and talk to them. And my argument was that, what the heck? There's an opening. Why don't you take advantage? Because involved in politics. And they would say, no, 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 but because there was a press there, they would refuse to engage in a kind of open discussion. I think there's a problem. Maybe others can, can correct me on this thing. I maybe it is a very serious issue. Sorry, I don't want to keep you all from your sandwiches, but I was very struck by the point that, and gratified to hear you speak about the, uh, the rise of the new Turkish middle class and um, the uh, so far successful experiment of uh, uh, an a party that is that is not Islamist but that is uh, running the country. The latest developments are not terribly positive, I think. But what interests me a lot is uh, what the offspring of the generation of the great capitalists in the Gulf who were very influential, the people who, um, you know, I, I was trying to think of the greatest capitalist in Qatar, uh, but I think of the Jada family, which did happen to be of Shia origin. And you mentioned um, that there could be political dynamism emerging from uh, the, the, uh, those sorts of people. Obviously, the great families, and I'm generalizing from the Qatar experience, which may not be a altogether sound thing to do, were in very close cahoots with the, um, with the Amiri Diwan and all that. What's happening specifically in terms of the, the next generations of the, uh, the great families, many of whom uh, educated extensively in the West? Are they showing characteristics uh, such as you describe? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, probably Kristen would know this better than I. I'll just make one well, comment about it, and that is just the, the, um, the likelihood is that it's not going to be the great families that drive the political change for what you just said. Is that they're, they're, just too, they're just too close to power uh, by, the, by, by uh, virtue of their, of their wealth. Um, but, but, the, but the more properly middle class, um, you know, the, the shopkeepers, the people I met in Turkey 10 years ago, 12 years ago, who were, it, who were openly and avidly, happily Islamist in their politics, were people who owned and ran like publishing houses. And, uh, you know, successful, you know, sort of above the rest, restaurant level, but, but not, you know, the, the Kochas and the Sabanjis and so on. They were, they were, you know, the, the real bourgeoisie, really. Sure. And, and um, I, 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 I sense that they're the ones who have helped bring uh, Erdogan to power. But in any case, you probably have 
Sorry, then could you broaden it and take it away from the great families to the <laughs> bourgeoisie in general? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, it's an important question, but I, I think those families haven't disappeared. Um, and the more recent period of the, the, the latest oil boom, we saw sort of the rise of this kind of state-led capitalism where the state kind of opened up new arenas for investment. And it's a lot of these same families, and along with some other newer ones that come in through their proximity to the state, that take advantage uh, of these opportunities. So, so those big families are still there. Well, what um, do they do? What's the bourgeoisie doing politically to get to the um, Well, I guess, again, I mean, I hate to be so quite-centric, but since it's the one I, I know the best and kind of work through, I mean, I think, you know, I, I kind of my presentation was this whole kind of sweep of uh, rising Islamization and the Islamists are getting more powerful in parliament. Of course, you know, my argument gets kind of uh, dented when you look at the last few elections and when actually the Islamists didn't do that well um, in the last election. In fact, the last two, the Muslim Brotherhood did terribly. Um, and I think part of that was a pushback by a lot of these big families um, in alliance with the state to clamp down on some of these institutions that were allowing for this mobilization. And I think you've, you've seen that in Kuwait. So I, I was surprised by it, actually. I didn't think, I thought that they had gone to the state to the extent that that wouldn't be possible, but I, I think it has <coughs> happened. Um, and you have to look, it's more complex, you have to look at a lot of the links with these tribal dynamics that I mentioned that are rising, that are complicating these things as well. Um, and there, there's a lot of competition taking place over, over those new tribal populations, which are the majority of the population when you look in terms of numbers. So there's a lot of competition between whether the state will be able to kind of use those forces and, and, and control those forces, or whether Islamists will be able to control those forces. And I think that's an interesting arena to look at in the future. Thank you. Well, I'm sure you would all agree we have had a very rich discussion, and we can continue for much longer. But I stand lunch awaits us. So would you please join me in thanking our panelists, and especially our host, Professor Richard Norton, for an extremely yes.